Hello? Yeah? OK, so I'll try to make it short to try to finish at um, 11. So um, today, um, I'd like to discuss uh, scattering uh, uh, transport. And so this is the basically the outline of the talk. So, oh, sorry. so we're going to first, I'm going to show some example of carrier transport, so some experiments. Then I'm going to start with the most uh, general theory, so starting from the quantum Boltzmann equation. So this will connect a bit with the uh, previous talk. And then uh, basically this talk will be mainly about doing a lot of approximation. So this, this equation will be super difficult to solve. So what we're going to do is we're going to start um, making some approximations. So we're going to have the uh, linearized Boltzmann transport equation. Um, and then from that, it's, it's still quite complicated to solve. So we're going to do even more approximations. So we're going to end up with the self-energy relaxation time approximation. Uh, and this can be used for semiconductor and for metals. And in the specific case of metals, we can even do a further approximation and go to the lowest order variation and approximation to compute, for example, resistivity. Um, and finally, I will uh, briefly talk about how to deal with uh, ionized impurity. So um, let's start. So when you have um, carrier propagating into a material, so it can be, for example, an electron or a hole, when it propagates, um, this electron will have some uh, interaction. So it will interact with the lattice. Um, so this is lattice scattering. So this is basically the electron to interaction that will slow down the, the flow of uh, a particle, so electrons or holes. Um, you can also have the particle interacting with some impurities. So you can have defects, that dislocation, things like that. This will also slow the uh, flow of electron. And finally, you can also have interaction between the particle and their cells. So if you have uh, a lot of carrier, they will start uh, interacting with themselves. This will also uh, hinder the propagation of the charge. Um, so in, um, so for example, uh, we can have different type of, of, of semiconductor. We can have uh, indirect band gap or, low, uh, or direct band gap. In both cases, you can have uh, transport. So the uh, electron and hole will, will propagate if you applied uh, an external uh, electric field. So, so what happened um, in intrinsic semiconductor, so if you, if you don't dope it, simply with the temperature, you will have a, a Fermi level. And some of the um, uh, electron will simply, uh, by thermal excitation, will go to the uh, conduction band. Um, but what I want to emphasize here is um, the fact that all of those transport property always happen very, very close to the band edge. So even in the case of gallium arsenide, where the, this upper uh, L valley is very close to the um, conduction band minimum, uh, so I think this, this may be 0.3 or 0.4 uh, EV, uh, only the bottom of the um, conduction band minimum contributes to towards the mobility, except if you are at crazy high temperature. So, so what we are really concerned about is, is describing very well the properties close to the uh, bottom uh, band edge. Um, so just to mention, uh, this will be uh, discussed more extensively tomorrow due to electron phone interaction, and we've also already discussed a bit that, the uh, band structure will change. It, it will be affected by electron phone uncoupling, and indeed, you will have a reduction of the bank up due to electron phone coupling. So this will not be included in, in the derivation today, but it could be. Um, so those calculations can be done with the initial, and there will be a lecture tomorrow about that. Um, so, so what happens is if you have a, an intrinsic semiconductor, as you uh, increase the temperature, so like, like you do here, you excite more and more charge. So you will have more and more carrier that will be um, available for, for conduction. And so the, the, the dots are this experiment. And you can see that even at the DFT level, the effective mass and, and the, so this is silicon, the effective mass and, and the shapes are quite well reproduced. And you can see that DFT falls almost uh, uh, on top of, of experiments. Uh, so this plot summarizes a bit what I've said. Um, so if you increase temperature, what you first see, so this is again silicon, you have a reduction of the bank gap. So the, the conduction band is going down, the valence band is going up, so the band gap shrinks a bit. And then what you're looking at is basically the position of the Fermi level such that you have this amount of charge uh, in the valence band. So if you want to have 10 to the 14 inverse centimeters cube charge, then you need to be at this position so that the Fermi Dirac distribution, the tail of the Fermi Dirac distribution, uh, arrives here and, and creates the correct number of holes. And then you have the corresponding one uh, here for the uh, conduction band. 
So the reason I'm showing this is because uh, this afternoon when we're going to do the uh, hands-on in, in EW, um, this is exactly what the code does. So you will, will ask the code, okay, I want to have this amount of charge, and then the code will automatically uh, try to find the position of the Fermi level such that you have this amount of charge. So in the code, you can even specify, okay, I want to have um, both the, the conduction and the uh, valence band done in the same calculation, so you will basically have two Fermi levels that will be created in the code. Um, the other thing to mention is also, you can see that those curves don't match exactly. And the reason for that is that the um, Fermi pockets uh, are different, of course, in the, in the conduction and the valence. So in the case of silicon, you have um, the conduction band minimum is along the gamma X line, and so you will have six conduction pockets where you can store uh, charge, whereas in the case of the conduction band, you only have the conduction band bottom where you can store charge. Um, so this is an experiment, so you have the mobility changing as a function of impurity concentration. So this is the number of carriers that you have in the system. So if you have a lot of charge, at some point, you can see that the mobility drops uh, quite dramatically because the charge starts to interacting with each other. However, if you have a relatively low amount of carrier, so let's say 10, less than 10 to the 15, then you are in this intrinsic regime and the mobility doesn't depend on the impurity concentration. So most, most of the uh, talk today would be actually focusing on this low impurity concentration limit where this doesn't vary with concentration. So if you are in this limit, you can also uh, look at the variation of the mobility with temperature. So you can see that the mobility is decreasing rapidly with temperature, and this makes sense because you have more electron phonon interaction, you have more uh, bosons uh, at higher temperature. Uh, so the lines are basically electron uh, uh, mobility, and the, the dash is the whole mobility, and they are shown for two kind of different range of, of carrier. So here it's low intrinsic carrier concentration. So if you are in, the, in this range, the mobility doesn't change with carrier concentration, but if you are in this higher uh, uh, carrier concentration regime, then the mobility, you can see, drops uh, dramatically. So um, now we're going to try to describe, uh, so, so basically we're going to try to compute this uh, a change of mobility with temperature uh, fully from ab initio. And so we start with the most general uh, quantum Boltzmann equation, and so instead of treating all the particle, all the electron in a many-body framework, that would be very, very difficult, we used a particle distribution function, and we tried to look at how this distribution function uh, evolved with uh, time. And so you can describe this uh, um, evolution of this uh, particle distribution function in terms of a lesser Green's function. So, so you've seen this morning um, what the Green's function is. And so the lesser Green's function is a different flavor of Green's function and can be described as this object. And in fact, when you want to compute the lesser Green's function, uh, in, in, in this uh, quantum Boltzmann equation, you get a very complicated set of uh, two by, so you get a two by two matrix uh, of Green's function, which you can recast into a set of couple, four couple uh, equations, so it's very difficult to solve. And, and so one of those equations involves a retarded Green function. So we've talked about time ordering, so this is a retarded Green's function, and this describes the dissipation of the system. So this is how the uh, dissipation enters. So this very general theory, and, and I'm not going to go into details, is, is valid for very uh, out of equilibrium systems, so very general uh, theory. However, it's very difficult to solve, so we want to do some approximation. So two approximations that we, we can do is considering the fact that, so you have an external uh, um, electric field, and you can consider that the electric field is homogeneous, so you don't have a variation of the electric field with, with position, and you can also consider that you are in steady state. So you, you look after some times, and you have a constant uh, electric field, and so if you do those two approximations, you can simplify the, uh, the expression and you get what is called the gradient expansion approximation. And so you get this rather complicated equation where you have this uh, spectral function, what we've seen this morning. Spectral function depends on the imaginary part of the electron, the retarded electron phonon of energy, and then you have this uh, um, uh, quasi-particle renormalization, which depends on the real part of the electron phonon of energy. Uh, and again, this is, this is quite difficult to solve, so we want to simplify even more, so we're going to do more approximation. But first we want to, to know what do we really want to, to, con to compute. So what we want is the uh, mobility. The mobility is basically what links, is the response we want of the system when you apply the electric field and what gives you the uh, current. So to compute the current, you basically need the mobility uh, times the 
uh, electric field. And we can show that um, this uh, uh, steady state electric current is equal to uh, this integral on this uh, distribution function. So in the case of, of the quantum distribution function, so this will be this object, but now we will try to, to really compute and simplify this distribution function so that we can compute this in, in, a, in a, let's say, DFT code. So what we are trying to do now is trying to find an expression for this occupation function. And in the, in the case where you don't have an electric field, this distribution function will simply reduce to the Fermi Dirac distribution function that we all know. So we are trying to look at what is the deviation from the uh, Fermi Dirac uh, uh, function to get this, this F and K. So obviously, if you want to get the mobility, you can just do the derivative. So you see, uh, if you do the derivative with respect to um, the electric field, then you, you get directly the uh, current. So derising the current with uh, the electric field gives you the mobility, and this is also linked with the conductivity uh, divided by the carrier concentration. So NE is the uh, electron carrier concentration. And the reason why we are interested in mobility and not so much about uh, conductivity is because in semiconductor, the mobility is independent on the carrier concentration, at least for this range, where, um, this relatively low uh, carrier concentration range. Um, so now, um, the only thing we need to do is do a derivative with respect to the current. So we want to look at the derivative of this distribution function with respect to uh, an external uh, electric field. Um, and so this is what we, we're going to try to do. Um, okay. So the Boltzmann equation is, is exactly trying to solve that. So in a semi-classical semi way. So actually, treating the electron as a classical particle, the propagation of the electron is a relatively good approximation. However, the electron scattering, so when the electron propagates and then at some point they interact with the system, you have a scattering event. This results uh, in, in short range forces and, and as a consequence, you really need to describe that quantum mechanically, otherwise you get really bad results. So the idea of the Boltzmann transport equation is to describe part of the equation uh, semi-classically and part of it quantum mechanically. So this is what, what I've said. So you will describe the motion in between scattering events as a semi-classical theory, but then the uh, scattering itself, uh, we, will, we will actually treat that uh, fully quantum mechanically. Um, and so, so this is the idea behind the Boltzmann transport equation. Um, so the, the equation will describe the evolution of this distribution function as a function of time, how does it evolve? And this is basically the sum of two terms. So you have all of these terms uh, up to here is basically how does the uh, distribution function evolve because of the external field. And then this is what happened between the distribution function due to scattering events. And when we are at equilibrium, then the, the change of that should be zero because you are in, in steady state. Um, and so what we've done here with all those terms is simply uh, doing partial derivative of all the um, uh, parameter on which the distribution function depends on. So it depends on, on, on time, depends on position. So here we've just done uh, derivative of position with respect to time, which is simply the velocity. Uh, and then you have a, um, a dependence on momentum and on temperature. And so this is, the, let's say, the full Boltzmann transport equation, but you can do further approximation on the way the electric field is applied in order to, to simplify uh, this first uh, part. So what you can do is you can uh, consider, as I said, an homogeneous field, so you don't have, let's say, variation in the field with respect to position. And so this will allow us to kill this term. We can also consider a constant temperature. So we can do the, the both, we can solve the Boltzmann transport equation for a fixed temperature, and then we can change the temperature and solve again, but we don't have a gradient of temperature. Uh, we can also consider DC conductivity, so not AC. So we have a, 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 an electric field which is constant with time. Um, and finally, we can, we can express this uh, change of momentum with time as uh, due to uh, external field. So you can have either uh, an electric field or you can have a magnetic field. So in this case, I'm just going to consider an electric field, but you can also consider a magnetic field. And actually, somebody in, in the audience, because I, I saw a, one of the posters, is actually uh, computing the effect of the Boltzmann transport equation when you uh, include a, a magnetic field. So this is very interesting, and uh, we'll see what, what, what they can do with this. I think this, this would be a very uh, major step uh, forward, but for the moment, we're just neglecting this 
a magnetic field, which means that in this equation here, we have E times dF dK. So we are left with only two terms. Um, so E times dF dK, and this will be treated, as I said, semi-classically, semi and then this fully quantum term, will, which is the scattering event um, that we have. So first we're gonna treat this uh, uh, right part, which is simply the collision-less, so everything that happened except the collision of the Boltzmann equation in a uniform constant electric field without temperature gradient and magnetic field. So if you have this very well-behaved electric field, then you reduce to, to this equation. And in addition, we can do a further approximation, which is the linearized Boltzmann transport equation. What that means is simply to consider that the applied electric field is small, so E is small. If you consider that it's small, you can then expand your uh, distribution function as a first order one and then a higher order in the uh, electric field. And so again, F0 is simply the Fermi Dirac distribution function that we can easily compute. And so if we do that, uh, we obtain this equation. So the velocity here comes simply from the fact that I have done the partial derivative, so I have dE dK, which is nothing but the velocity, and then dF0 dEK. And we, we like this term very much because we can compute everything. This we can get from dFT, and then dF0 simply Fermi Dirac, we, we can easily derivate this with the eigen energy. So now let's look at the other term, which is the uh, term coming from the scattering. So there are four possibilities um, to which the system can scatter. So if you consider the, the state F and K, what can happen is you can have particles coming out of the state and they can come out uh, absorbing by absorbing a phonon or they can come out by emitting a phonon. So you have those two possibilities. You also have the possibility of a particle coming in the state, uh, again, by emitting a phonon or absorbing a phonon. So those are the only four possibilities particle going out, particle going in. Um, and so it's possible to then cast this in, in uh, equation. So you have those four, again, those four uh, mechanisms. So the, the, those four lines describe those four processes of uh, emission and absorption in and out of the state F and K. So you can see that here, I always have those F and K and F M K plus Q, but notice that here I don't have the F zero. So this is still the uh, distribution function that I want to find, so the difficult one. And here, you can see that, again, we have this electron phonon matrix element that we've been talking uh, uh, in, the, in the previous lecture. Um, and so this uh, uh, electron phonon matrix element has been discussed uh, uh, yesterday. So uh, just as a reminder, it's the, so you have the periodic part of the wave function, and then you have the change of the self-consistent potential due to uh, ion moving. So when the ion moves, this will impact the self um, consistent uh, potential. And so uh, what we end up with is uh, uh, basically this equation. And how do we obtain this equation? It's very simple. So you start from this equation, and the only thing you do is you do a derivative with respect to the field. Why do we want to do that? If you remind, if you remember um, the, um, so the, the, the conductivity that we tried to compute, uh, it depends on the derivative of the F with respect to uh, the electric field. So we want to compute the derivative of this object with respect to the electric field. And so if you do the derivative on both sides, it's just by doing the derivative, so there is no approximation, no trick, you get this equation, where you can see that here on the, on the, on the left side, I have this derivative, which is exactly what I'm looking for, derivative of the uh, distribution function with respect to the electric field along the direction uh, beta. And on the right side, I have basically everything else, and now I have this derivative, but at f m k plus q. And so the way to solve this is actually to solve it iteratively. So what you do is you plug some number, let's say random number at the beginning, you solve this equation and you get a new number. And then you plug that number back here at a different point and then you compute again, you do all the summation, you get a new number. And so you solve this iteratively, it's quite expensive but it can be done. And then you get the iterative Boltzmann transport equation. So that's, let's say, the most general um, um, Boltzmann equation uh, that you have. Um, and notice that here I have introduced those uh, terms, so tau zero, which is the scattering rate, and those have been introduced because they are quite convenient. You can show that they are equal to two times the imaginary part of the fan migdal uh, electron phonon self energy that was presented uh, in the previous talk. And so it's, uh, it's really a nice uh, connection. And let's say the most brutal approximation that you can do is simply to say, okay, this term is a bit difficult to compute. Let's neglect, basically let's neglect this term. So we neglect all of this. 
And then we are left with only those two terms. And so if we do that, that's called the, uh, so we call this the self-energy relaxation time approximation. Why? Because if you neglect all of this term, you are left with this term. And here, you can see that you have, you have this tau zero, which is nothing but the uh, relaxation time. And as I show here, the relaxation time is proportional to the self-energy. And this is why we call it the self-energy relaxation time approximation, because you have a direct connection with the electron phonon on self-energy. Um, and so when you have this very uh, simplified uh, equation, so this is basically the uh, um, Boltzmann uh, transport equation in the self-energy relaxation time approximation, then you can plug it in uh, back into this equation for the mobility, where again, we have this term, so you just plug it here. And then you have a very convenient form to compute the, the mobility, and this is uh, implemented in EPW, and also the iterative Boltzmann is, is also implemented. And you can see that here we have things that are quite easy to compute. So we have a derivative of the uh, Fermi Dirac distribution function. Then we have two velocity. And then again, we have this uh, tau. And this <coughs> tau uh, only depends on things that we can compute, electron phonon matrix element. And then again, Fermi Dirac distribution function and delta function. So this, this is now e relatively easy to compute. OK? So how does it work? So um, this is a, the intrinsic carrier mobility of silicon, um, and so in uh, yellow, mm, orange is the electron mobility. Uh, so the line is the uh, calculated electron mobility, and uh, the dots are the experiment, and then this is the hole. So the, that, the plain line is the uh, fully, uh, let's say, ab initio result, and you can see that we overestimate experiments. And the reason for that is that this is very specific to the case of silicon. It turns out that the one of the effective mass uh, in, in the valence band uh, is poorly described by DFT or GW. So the light hole in one of the direction is, is badly described. And so I couldn't find any way to, to correct it. So basically what I did is simply change that effective mass by the experimental one. And, and then you get this dashed line. So this is really a failure of, let's say, DFT or, or GW to describe the effective mass uh, properly. So if, if the effective mass are not properly described, then the mobility will be wrong. If you have good effective mass, you can expect to have relatively good mobility. So this is the dashed line, okay? So this is a, a bit technical, but it's just if you, if you are interested in. So this is uh, a bit the impact of a lot of um, common um, um, thing that we like to do in, when we study uh, DFT. So the impact of exchange correlation uh, uh, potential. So it turns out that, um, so I've applied two uh, functional LD and PB. It turns out that they lead to relatively different mobility, but this is only because the uh, lattice parameter is different. If you now do the, uh, those two functional, but at the experimental lattice parameter, you can see that the mobility is very similar. So you don't have a strong impact of uh, exchange correlation functional. Now, something that does make a difference is spin orbit coupling. It doesn't make a big difference in the electron mobility, but in the whole mobility, it makes a difference because you have uh, a splitting. So you have spin orbit splitting of the three degenerate valence band top state, and which means that instead of having three degenerate bands, you will have only two. So you have less uh, scattering channel, and as a result, the whole mobility increases. Uh, then I'm also showing some the effect of, of having GW corrected band structure, and uh, and the effect of having uh, iterative Boltzmann transport equation. So in the case of silicon, the difference between the iterative solution and the self-energy solution is really not that big. But um, some people have also done calculation in, in in polar material, and it turns out that in in arsenide at least. The iterative Boltzmann solution is, is quite higher, as you can see, uh, than the self-energy relaxation time approximation. So for those materials, it's, it's relatively important to solve the equation iteratively. So this can be done, but it's, of course, much more time consuming because you need to solve this, and it takes typically six, seven steps to be converged. But already, this only doing once, like this one shot takes already a lot of time. So if you need to do that six times, it's much more expensive, obviously. Um, so this, is, this, is, this theory is basically valid for both semiconductor and uh, metals. And I will show later that some people have actually done um, the Boltzmann transport equation on metals, so you can totally do it. Um, however, it exists uh, another approximation called the lowest order variational approximation. And that approximation is only valid for metals. And so what you can do is uh, have another set of two approximations. So you can say, OK, what happened if I have a isotropic uh, relaxation time, and also if I assume that the density of state at the Fermi level is a slowly varying function, 
which is in the case of metal usually true. You don't have a sharp uh, change of the density of state. Or that in semiconductor, this is completely not true. Uh, obviously, close to the Fermi level, you will have a sharp change of the density of state. So in the case of metal, this is more or less more or less correct. Um, and so if you do those two approximations, it, it's really possible mathematically to go from the Boltzmann transport equation, uh, apply those two approximations, and then you get this LOVA equation. So as you can see, this equation is quite different. So it actually involves a lot of steps, but it's possible to go from one to this equation just by doing those two approximations. And so you can see here, we, we are computing the uh, carrier resistivity within this approximation. And you can see uh, that you have this alpha square f, which is what we've done yesterday during the hands-on. But here it's slightly different. It's alpha square f transport. And so this is very similar to what you've been doing yesterday. So again, you have this g square, and then you have the, those delta function. Uh, notice that the delta function are always at the Fermi level. So it's really what happened at the Fermi uh, level, Fermi surface. But now you have those velocity terms that enter. And those velocity terms come naturally when you do the derivation from the Boltzmann transport equation. You will get those velocity terms that appear. And we define this new uh, Eliasberg spectral function as the transport spectral function. Um, right. And so, yeah, this can, this can be solved. And um, we can solve this, for example, in the case of lead um, using this, this uh, transport Eliasberg uh, spectral function. And the, the result uh, can be relatively good. So in blue, you have the result without spin-orbit coupling, but of course, lead is a very heavy element. Therefore, spin-orbit coupling is, is quite important. And then you, you can include spin-orbit coupling, and you get results that are much closer to experiment, despite all the approximation that we've done. So uh, this has all also been looked, for example, in the case of aluminum. And in, in this uh, uh, paper, what has been done is actually to compare the, the, the three uh, approximations. So you have the LOVA, so the resistivity, which is the, the green dashed line. And then they also did the calculation of the iterative Boltzmann solution and the self-energy relaxation time. So this is to show that uh, those uh, Boltzmann transport equations can also be uh, applied to metals, and it also works. OK? And so I want to, to, to maybe uh, finish today by uh, talking a bit about the um, Brook Herring uh, models for uh, impurity scattering. So this is when you have a very large concentration of, 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 of uh, impurities. Then you, as, as you, if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I showed that the mobility was decreasing uh, very uh, fast if you had a lot of uh, carrier. So this, uh, at the moment, cannot really be treated fully ab initio. It's quite a difficult problem. And so there exists some empirical uh, semi-empirical uh, formula, and the brook herring model is, is one of them. Um, so it involves the uh, effective mass uh, and, and a lot of physical parameters, I mean, just physical constants. Um, and it turns out that uh, this semi-empirical model works relatively well for the, mobil the whole mobility of silicon, but it doesn't work so well for the electron mobility. And the reason for that is that the uh, electron mass in silicon is very anis anisotropic. So along this gamma, um, X direction, the effective mass is something like 0.97, but the, the perpendicular to that is 0.19. So you have a strong anisotropy in the effective mass of silicon. And so uh, Long and Norton developed a correction to the brook herring model to take that into account. And so you can see that uh, already uh, this depend the model that you have to apply depends a bit on the system. So it's definitely not general. It's not something you can use for any semiconductor. Uh, so in the case of silicon, there, are, there have been a lot of models developed because this was very important uh, uh, back in the days. And so using this um, impurity scattering mobility formula, you can try to compute what is the total uh, uh, mobility. And so the total mobility uh, will be, if you want, the, the, the sum of the two effects. So usually what you do is you use what is called the Mathison rule. So the Mathison rule is simply 1 over the total mobility. It's equal to 1 over the uh, impurity limited uh, scattering mobility plus 1 over the uh, for non-limited uh, mobility. But there is actually a slightly better way to combine those two uh, uh, mobility, which is this um, yeah, integrated uh, formula. And so if you use that, you can compute the sum of both the for non-limited uh, mobility and the impurity scattering uh, uh, mobility. So at the low impurity concentration range, so around here, you have the DFT result, so those, uh, DFT or GW purely ab initio 
calculated results. So the one where you have intrinsic, only intrinsic mobility, so only um, um, electron phonon uh, coupling that, uh, that, are, that are involved. And then, this, and then you, you add the results from the impurity scattering from the semi-empirical semi model, and you get those uh, curves. So again, this is the fully, let's say, ab initio result, and this is the one where you can, uh, I corrected the uh, effective mass. And you can see that it gets quite good agreement with, with experiments in the case of silicon. Um, and so, yeah, let's see how it goes fast, actually, which is quite good. So if you, if you have any question, I'm happy to, to answer. So the, those are the, the reference uh, uh, book. Um, so yeah, all are quite, quite good. So Zeman is, is really one of the earliest uh, uh, reference. Uh, Mahan is, is quite easy to, to read. And, and this one from uh, Marker and Lundstorm is what was really good. So I encourage you to, to read them. So if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. And if not, we can go for a bit earlier to the coffee break. Yeah.